Today on Newswatch, Democratic presidential candidates square off in their first debate in Las Vegas. We are there to bring you the highlights. Plus, damage control, Planned Parenthood, stops accepting money for fetal tissue. See why lawmakers say this still isn't enough. This faith and patriotism that caused me to be a firefighter in the first place. Fired after more than 30 years of service for something he said in a Bible study. But the former Atlanta fire chief is firing back. Thanks so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. The first Democratic presidential debate is now in the record books. Frontrunner Hillary Clinton took on her leading challenger, Bernie Sanders, for the very first time. CBN's David Brody is in Las Vegas with the story. Going in, odds were on which of Hillary Clinton's challengers might attack the frontrunner, but it was Clinton who mixed it up, accusing her main rival, Bernie Sanders, as being weak on gun control. Senator Sanders did vote five times against the Brady bill. Since it was passed, more than two million prohibited purchases have been prevented. What I can tell Secretary Clinton that all the shouting in the world is not going to do what I would hope all of us want, and that is keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have those guns and end this horrible violence that we are seeing. And it wasn't only the participants who put Clinton on the spot. Are you a progressive or are you a moderate? I'm a progressive, but I'm a progressive who likes to get things done. She also faced questions about reversing positions on issues like the recent trade agreement. Do you change your political identity based on who you're talking to? No, I think that uh, like most people that I know, I have a range of views, but they are rooted in my values and my experience. As for the big controversy regarding the private email server that she used as Secretary of State, it not only wasn't an issue in this debate. Well, I've taken responsibility for it. I did say it was a mistake. It actually gave Clinton one of her best moments as Sanders came to her defense. I think the secretary is right. And that is that the American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. Thank you. Me too. Me too. <laughs> that friendliness came to an end when the conversation turned to the Vermont senator's self-described socialist views. Democratic socialism is about is saying that it is immoral and wrong that the top one-tenth of one percent in this country own almost 90 percent, almost own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. Then Sanders started praising socialist-type programs in Europe. I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden and Norway and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. I think what Senator Sanders is saying certainly makes sense in the terms of the inequality that we have. But we are not Denmark. I love Denmark. We are the United States of America. That exchange led to Sanders accusing Clinton of being too cozy with Wall Street and big banks. Secretary Clinton, you do not, Congress does not regulate Wall Street. Wall Street regulates Congress. Sanders and Clinton also seem to differ on how Edward Snowden should be viewed after giving away American secrets. He broke the laws of the United States. I think um, Snowden played a very important role in educating the American people uh, to the degree in which our civil liberties and our constitutional rights are being undermined. The other players on stage, like Jim Webb and Lincoln Chafee, really couldn't break through. Though former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley did take a dig at Clinton's call for a no-fly zone right now in Syria. I believe that a no-fly zone in Syria at this time, actually, Secretary, would be a mistake. You have to enforce no-fly zones. As the Democrat nomination process continues, you can make the argument that Hillary Clinton's campaign could start resembling the Hoover Dam. The popular landmark behind me has one main purpose, and that is to control flooding. Well, Hillary Clinton's campaign is already taking on water from Bernie Sanders' campaign, and if Vice President Joe Biden gets into the race, well, that's a whole lot of water, a whole lot of potential flooding that she's going to have to contain herself. David Brody, CBN News at the Hoover Dam in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
David, thank you. Republican presidential candidate Jeb Bush has proposed a plan to repeal and to replace Obamacare. His plan gives more power to states to regulate health insurance, repeals insurance mandates, and eliminates the expansion of Medicaid. The Jeb Bush plan also increases tax credits for individuals to buy coverage for high-cost medical needs, and it guarantees coverage for people with pre-existing health conditions, one of the most popular features in Obamacare. The Bush campaign says it's a conservative plan that will lower health care costs, but one Bush campaign opponent doesn't think it's so conservative. Bobby Jindal tweeted, there's an empty podium at the Democrat debate. Jeb Bush should take it and argue for his obamacare light health care proposal. Planned Parenthood has launched a new effort at damage control, announcing it will no longer accept cash for fetal tissue donations. But, abortion gi- but that abortion giant will continue to harvest fetal tissue for research. The man behind the undercover videos that expose the gruesome practice says the policy change is an admission of guilt. As Caitlin Burke reports, this latest shift comes as scrutiny continues to mount. It's Planned Parenthood's latest attempt at damage control. The group's president writing a letter Tuesday to the U.S. director of the National Institute of Health, announcing Planned Parenthood will no longer accept money for fetal tissue donations. Adding, quote, Planned Parenthood's policies on fetal tissue donation already exceed the legal requirements. Now we're going even further in order to take away any basis for attacking Planned Parenthood to advance an anti-abortion political agenda. This letter comes after Planned Parenthood's practice of selling baby body parts was thrust into the spotlight through a series of undercover videos from the Center for Medical Progress. Republicans have launched several investigations into Planned Parenthood, along with an effort to cut off the organization's federal funding. Kristen Hawkins from Students for Life says Planned Parenthood has been exposed. Now it's up to the American public to pull its support. Planned Parenthood wants us to use this so they can say, oh, well, we took care of that. And really the question for that we're asking on college campuses is if your health care provider just admitting that it's no longer going to sell the reports of aborted babies, do you trust them on anything else? Planned Parenthood says its fetal tissue program currently takes place in two states, California and Washington. The Washington state affiliate already has a policy of accepting no reimbursement. The remaining clinics will now be following suit. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Republicans are pushing to remove a sculpture of Planned Parenthood's founder from the Smithsonian. Presidential candidate Ted Cruz and Congressman Louis Gohmert are leading 26 Republicans who called the bust of Margaret Sanger an outrage. They've issued a letter calling for it to be immediately removed from the National Portrait Gallery's Struggle for Justice exhibit. The letter noted Ms. Sanger was an avowed advocate of eugenics and the extermination of groups of people she deemed as undesirables. This follows a request a group of black pastors sent to the Smithsonian back in August. Turning overseas now, Israel's cabinet held an emergency session to strategize its response to rising Palestinian violence. Terrorists killed three Israelis and wounded 20 during its day of rage. But Palestinian social media paints Israelis as the aggressors. Our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell is on this story. We warn you, some of the video in his report is graphic. This is what a terror attack looks like and what Israelis have been facing for weeks. This Palestinian man rammed his car into a bus stop. He got out and hacked 60-year-old Rabbi Krzyzewski to death. He then began attacking 78-year-old Haviv Hamim with a meat cleaver. Finally, a nearby security guard stopped him. Despite clear evidence and security camera footage of many of these attacks, Palestinian social media is accusing Israeli police of executing the attackers. Palestinian negotiator Saeed Arakat is also calling on the International Criminal Court to investigate Israel. A case in point, Israeli police confront this Palestinian woman brandishing a knife. When she refuses to surrender the knife, they shoot her in the legs. Yet this picture implies Israeli police shot her for no reason. This picture and others fail to show the attacks themselves, just the aftermath. Michael Widlansky, author of Battle for Our Minds, says disinformation is an old trick. Mahmoud Abbas studied disinformation techniques when he was a student in the Soviet Union at the Patrice Lumumba University of the KGB. He studied this. 
and it is always to invent an atrocity story. You send out somebody to kill a Jew, he kills a Jew, or three Jews, or five Jews, and then he gets killed, and then you claim he was murdered by the Israeli police. It's a bunch of baloney. What's driving many of these Palestinians to kill is, they say they must protect the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. But one thing you should know about the Palestinian Arab leadership, they use the same formula every time. When they get into trouble, they say the Jews are coming to attack us. They're coming to attack the Temple Mount. That's what they did in 1921, 1922, 1929, what Arafat did in 2000. Mahmoud Abbas did the same thing this year. They even use the same term, Yihajimu al-Aqsa, they're attacking al-Aqsa. In order to protect the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this imam in Gaza calls on West Bank Palestinians to impose what he calls a curfew of stabbing to keep Israelis terrorized so they'll stay inside. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat says it's this kind of incitement that kills. Those incitements are sending people to kill innocent people. We've just seen in the last few days children, uh, high school children that are incited that go and try and, uh, and terrorize and kill uh, policemen. They don't return home. They themselves get killed. The incitement kills on both sides. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Just weeks before sanctions against Iran start being lifted as a result of the nuclear agreement, the country's military tested a new ballistic missile, possibly violating UN Security Council resolutions. The nuclear agreement calls on Iran not to undertake any activity related to ballistic missiles. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest said such violations are nothing new, but he added that the latest violations are entirely separate from the historic nuclear deal. The State Department said the U.S. will raise the matter at the U.N. Security Council. And this Atlanta fire chief was fired for his faith. Today, he heads back to court to fight back. His story when we return. It is a case of being fired for faith. Today marks the start of former Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran's first hearing in his wrongful termination lawsuit against the city. Chief Cochran was fired after 34 years of service after he wrote a Bible study book that disagreed with the city's policies. Abigail Robertson has more. Once one of the highest ranked fire officials in the country, former Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran has now seen his career ripped away from him for expressing his religious views in a Bible study book. This faith and patriotism that caused me to be a firefighter in the first place. Chief Cochran dedicated 34 years of his life to serving in the public fire department and was appointed Atlanta Fire Chief in 2008. But last November, he was abruptly terminated from his dream job after a complaint to a gay city councilman. The councilman then went to Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed. The complaint involved a passage in the book about biblical views of sex, including statements against homosexuality, using terms like perversion, inappropriate, and unclean. The complaint called that passage offensive. For well, that faith, uh, to lead to all the career successes that I've had to ultimately conclude or end my career by expressing it in a book uh, is just unthinkable in the United States of America. Cochran asked permission from the Atlanta Ethics Department before writing the faith-based book, and he only distributed it to co-workers who had already established a relationship with as believers. He even gave a copy to Mayor Reed, who congratulated him on writing it and promised to read it. Cochran was shocked to learn his book would be offensive to anybody. It was such a shock to everyone uh, that it would occur and it would be so abrupt. There was a lot of just heartache and heartbreak and tears. The city launched an investigation to find out if coworkers felt Chief Cochran had created a discriminatory environment, including possible discrimination against gays. The investigation found that he hadn't, but Mayor Reed fired Chief Cochran, claiming he would not tolerate discrimination of any kind in his administration. In February of this year, Chief Cochran filed a lawsuit against the city of Atlanta, saying he had been wrongfully fired. Kelvin Cochran is fighting to prove Americans should not have to live in fear of being terminated from their jobs because of their religious beliefs. 
David Cortman, one of the lawyers defending Chief Cochran, says this is not just a fight about vindicating the chief, but rather a fight to protect every American's right to freedom of speech. The reason this case is so important to everyone is we have the federal government telling someone, if you don't agree with their views, with their orthodoxy, you are not fit to hold a position. You are not fit to make a living. That should worry everyone. Chief Cochran says his former co-workers are afraid to express their support or reactions because of fear of the potential consequences. They can't say, I believe, like Chief Cochran believes, for fear that they will be terminated as well. No American should have to choose between living out their faith and keeping their job. Since his termination, faith communities in the Atlanta area and around the country have given the Cochran family a tremendous outpouring of love and support. He asked for continued prayer for the mayor and the city, as well as for strength for his wife and children. I've never felt that I was in this all by myself, not for a moment. Chief Cochran stays positive by believing that all suffering is for the glory of God and that he would not be going through this had God not prepared him for it. Reporting from Atlanta, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Up next, using your smartphone to schedule surgery. Hear how a new website called Sergio allows you to compare surgeons and prices up front. You know, you can do almost anything these days from your smartphone, read the news, watch television, and even, of course, go shopping online. Now you can also make arrangements for surgery with just a few simple clicks, and you can check out which doctor you want to do it. Lori Johnson shows us how a new website allows you to compare surgeons' credentials as well as their prices. When your doctor tells you surgery is in your future, it leads to a lot of emotions and questions. Fear, worry, who do I choose? How am I going to pay for it? Dr. Arnon Krongrad wanted to make the whole process easier and less intimidating. The Miami surgeon developed Sergio.com, a website where patients can choose their surgeon, location, and flat rate price. It's really important because what we're seeing around us today is the contraction of choice. It's the opposite of what we want. Consumers deserve more choice, not less choice. This is a refuge from the bureaucracy and the complexity and the minutiae that surround us every day in our healthcare ecosystem. Dr. Krongrad chose surgeons for the site who are tops in their field and highly recommended by their peers. Sergio is based on a very simple premise. Nobody knows surgeons like other surgeons. So. We find surgeons who are extremely highly qualified and we ask them a simple question. If you need this procedure, who would you go to yourself? Sergio's doctors develop their own all-inclusive package for one upfront price. Sergio allows consumers to compare bundled packages and choose which one they like best. We're used to this model on websites for things like travel, cable TV, and insurance, but this is new for healthcare. First, patients click on the recommended procedure, let's say knee replacement. Up pop several packages from doctors across the country. Each package clearly shows an all-inclusive price, which covers the surgeon's fee, anesthesia, physical therapy, the hospital stay, and the implant. This one price even covers the cost of dealing with any complications that may arise during or after surgery. Patients will act in surprising ways. They don't only want to go down the corner. Uh, you know, they don't only want to go to the closest surgeon. Sometimes they're looking for something very specific, like the best surgeon, and they'll travel half a continent away to get what they're looking for. Reconstructive urologist Dr. Dean Knoll participates in Nashville, Tennessee. When I heard about it being a uh, healthcare logistics company, that was driven by surgeons, I was quite excited. He says the upfront pricing gives patients the answers they deserve. If you look at the healthcare industry, it's the only service sector that we really don't know the cost of procedures because it varies from city to city, it varies from hospital to hospital. And subsequently the patients, particularly if their coverage, insurance coverage doesn't cover this procedure, they're lost. Dr. Knoll helped develop the Sergio Panel of Doctors. 
He brings 30 years of experience and travels the country teaching surgery. Having done this for that number of years, when I do get the opportunity to operate with a surgeon, it usually becomes quite apparent very early on in the experience whether or not this is going to be a, a very, very good surgeon or not. Kimberly Langer, who helped start the service, says they even build custom surgery packages. If you need a service in either um, a particular location or you want one that's not listed on the website, we can absolutely put something together. Um, usually within a few days, we have a phenomenal network of surgeons that, that can reach out and find, you know, equally qualified surgeons uh, in different areas. Although Sergio currently serves self-pay patients, it's useful for anyone considering surgery because it reveals all the various expenses that go into a surgery. The first thing that I just recommend people do is look. If anything, it's going to provide you an opportunity to educate yourself on the things that you need to consider as being included in your surgery. So regardless of whether you select a surgery service from Sergio or if you, determine, if you decide you want to go to a different source, you at least know these are the major components that I need to know that I have in place that are going to otherwise be financial surprises that I'm not going to want. Sergio.com brings choosing a surgeon into the digital age and takes away many of the questions and worries for patients in the process. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Christian Music was honored last night and the Dove Award for Artist of the Year goes to rapper Lecrae. Lecrae continues to bring new fans to the Christian genre while also breaking the mold for gospel artists. The Grammy Award-winning artist made history last year when his seventh album titled Anomaly became the first to top Billboard and gospel album charts in the very same week. Lecrae also won for Rap Hip Hop Album of the Year and Rap Hip Hop Song of the Year. It is time now for your Wednesday word, and today's word is purpose. Many people spend their lives searching for it, wondering, why am I here and what am I supposed to be doing? In that search, consider this. Your purpose empowers you to do two things. The first is to know God, and the second is to make Him known. How are you measuring up? As long as you're breathing, it is never too late to get busy living on purpose. Make this a wonderful Wednesday. And that is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.